All right. Well, hey, I'm pleased to be joined by Ozzy Nelson, Jr., CEO of Twin Cities architecture firm Nelson Worldwide. Um, the firm is behind more than a dozen building repositionings in Minneapolis in the last couple of years, reimagining everything from skyscrapers to office parks for the future of work. Um, first of all, Ozzy, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well, Brian. Thank you. And very pleased to be here. Yeah, thank you. Well, so just to get started, I guess we'll talk about some of your repositioning projects, some of the work you've been doing. But for folks who aren't familiar with you or your company, can you talk a little bit about Nelson Worldwide, how long you've been in business and that type of thing? Sure, sure. We have been uh, in business about 45 years, uh, about 700 teammates in 17 locations across uh, across the U.S., uh, based here in uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, and I guess uh, if there's something somewhat novel about us, we're organized by practice, so eight practices, uh, and each of those practices has uh, has the P&L. So many of our competitors organized by geography, we organize by practice. And I think, um, you know, because of that, that gives us a lot more uh, ability to go deep in each of these practices. And as we as we talk about asset strategy, which is the practice that uh, you know does the repositioning business, um, I think that'll be a, a good example of of uh, what our practices do. Okay, and how many people do you have right here in the Twin Cities, approximately? Uh, we're about forty people here. Okay, all right. And uh, so tell us a little bit about some of the projects you've been working on lately. And uh, just we alluded to the repositionings. Um, what can you tell us about that uh, and, and any details you can share about any specific projects? Sure. So I think uh, two of the ones that uh, have been some of the larger scale uh, and have gotten the most uh, notoriety of uh, 901 uh, Marquette, which was formerly the AT&T building, uh, and uh, 222 uh, or, or two buildings where there was a pretty significant uh, renovation to the lobby, many amenity areas. Um, they, the 901 Marquette, interestingly, um, uh, a project that was done uh, before the pandemic, um, but really has so much of the pa pandemic uh, or post-pandemic characteristics, i.e. you walk into that building and it feels more like a living room than a lobby. Uh, so this idea of borrowing from um, hospitality and retail trends to bring that to both the design of office uh, amenity spaces, but also offices themselves, um, I think uh, has has certainly benefited us and is uh, I think a lot of what a lot of clients are looking for. You know, when you do get people back into the office, the last thing you want to do is have them walk into this uh, you know mahogany uh, type nineteen eighties office building that reminds them that they're back at the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the old corner office for the executive and everybody else has the cubicles and um, yes, I get it. But I, I have to put in a plug for the work you've done at 222 building, as you might know, finance and commerce is a tenant there and uh, just did a great job with that Thank project. You. And so, yeah, um, both, of those, uh, both of those projects, one uh, reposition of the of the year um, uh, from Boma. So we're very proud that it uh, not only stands out locally, but was a, an international award winner. So there's been a lot of talk about in the offices of flight to quality. This is a good example of that, right? You just want to make it a nice place for people to come to, to be excited to go back to the office. And yeah, in fact, I, you know, I I think, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's almost a two front war. You have the, what does the building do for you when you're in the building? Um, well, you know, I think one of the trends in um, across the board is, looking for more amenities from the building so that the tenant can take a smaller space that has less conferencing, less of their own amenities with the idea that you go, you know, in the building, both to get variety, but also to, to enjoy those amenities. Um, so it, the two front war is, you know, what's the, what does the building offer from the time you walk in through the services in the building? 
And then what's the office space itself like when you come in and is it, is it inviting? Is it, um, you know, people, uh, I, you know, I think uh, very obvious that people are not doing the commute to come in and do a lot of heads down space. So how do you create space that, um, you know, promotes collaboration, but does have those spaces either in the building or in the office where when people do have to do some occasional head down space, they can. Yeah, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're seeing some of these other trends in other types of uses as well. Religious institutions, for example, churches, places of worship. We have uh, a church that I attend recently did a, a pretty nice renovation where it looks more like you walk in and it looks more like a Starbucks <laughs> gathering area <laughs> when you go inside. They have nice, comfortable seating places, things like that, versus just your typical uh receptionist desk and, and and things of that nature uh, i don't know if you work on any of those projects as well but it seems like this is a trend that uh, cuts across different project types yeah i i think the um you know i think uh, obviously historians will look at the changes that the pandemic had for us i think in some cases uh it was the great accelerator of things you know this ability to work. We, we had that ability for 10 years, but it took, you know, everybody wanting to save their job to, to work at home and make it work. Uh, but I do think this um, more focus on um, it, human interaction, I'll, I'll just say, um, mm -hmm. you know, cuts across everything from eccle ecclesiastical design uh, to design of, of just about every kind of space. Mm hmm so what can you tell us about uh, just, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges of these projects um, from taking a building that was maybe designed for a traditional office and remaking it in the way you've described? Yeah, I think, you know, there's um, so our asset strategy business does two things. One, uh, it is uh, a, a design consultancy to uh buildings in a strategic way to, uh, you know, first of all, take a look at what's the competitive inventory, who are the people that you're trying to attract, what's the current brand of the building, what's the desired brand, um, and, you know, really what's the most effective uh, and, and logical way to invest in a building if you're going to. If you're a if you're a B minus building, can you really become, you know, a B plus building? What's the cost of that? And if you do that, are you just competing with a bunch of other B plus buildings uh, for not enough tenancy? So, you know, it's sort of like a the 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 repositions part of it is really this Rubik's cube where you're looking at market conditions, uh, tenancy in the market, and occupancy trends, um, and where the building is today. Um, against other buildings and, and against, you know, how you, how you fill the building. Um, so that's the first part of what we do. Um, and then um, once there's a strategy that we execute on, then we're very partnered with that building. There's over um, 1,350 buildings across the U.S. where we're the architect of record. So that tenant shows up, we're the first call from either the broker or the building. So, um, but but in that that whole strategy side, I, you know, I think the 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 across the board things that we're looking for you know, that people are looking for are amenities, whether that's um, uh, amenities within the building, like uh, conference centers or like the eighteen or the nine hundred one health market. Got to be careful because we're in that building, so I, I need mm -hmm. to use their. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, that first floor is sort of a living room type space. Uh, but everything from dry cleaning, uh, um, fitness rooms, people want to combine. Uh, you know, I think I think the mind shift has or the mindset has shifted to: if I'm going to come in the office, what are the other things that I can do? Uh, can, you know, is there dry cleaning in the building, so I don't have to on Saturday do my dry cleaning. I, I can I can uh, combine that with when I'm in the office. So I think amenity spaces are important. I think safety. Um, tremendously important, both perceived and, you know, uh, the reality of, of what um, uh, buildings are doing to keep their buildings safe. Um, 
Um, but again, I think, uh, and then I think getting very specific to, I mean, there are certain buildings that are targeting um, law firms. There are other buildings that are targeting back office um, and figuring out what is your occupancy strategy and then wrapping all of this activity around that. Um, I, I think those are the buildings that are, that are the most successful. The, the one thing I would, I would add in all of this evaluation is that you know, people want to know how strong the balance sheet of the building is or the owner of the building, um, you know, security, not only in terms of physical security, but also, you know, is this a landlord that's going to have this building for the long term? Um, you know, people are asking those questions where years ago they didn't. Mm -hmm. well, we've been hearing a lot, too, about conversions uh, from office to apartments. Have you been working on those types of projects as well? Yes, we have. We have uh, a number of those tests going on, probably in four different cities right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a lot of that comes down to two things, the building systems uh, and the, the, the uh, physical layout or footprint of the building. You know, a wider footprint um, is, is going to be much more challenging to make work than, you know, a, a narrower footprint that has windows that are accessible and all of that. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, there are some interesting examples of, of the conversion. And, you know, I think, again, that um, that's an interesting piece of that Rubik's Cube is uh, how, you know, what is the what is the access to quality housing to the building uh, and, and, and how, capitalizing on the movement of residential neighborhoods, uh, because, again, the reality is um, you know, people did not have to drive into work for two plus years and uh, and they're looking for the easiest commute they can get. Yeah, for sure. And you want to be able to bring the natural light into the interior spaces as much as Absolutely. possible, right? And that's just, Absolutely. If the building's not conducive to that, uh, it could be problematic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where that footprint of the building really makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. So um, what, what can you tell us about some of the uh, repositioning trends you're seeing in the suburbs versus the core downtown areas and how are they uh, approaches uh, different? Yeah, I, you know, I, I generally speaking, um, I think the, uh, uh, the uh, live, work, play, um, you know, broader amenities uh, to suburban offices uh, are, are you know you assume that if you go downtown you're going to have access to restaurants and the like mm -hmm. when you go in the suburbs uh, you know are you just going to this standalone uh, office building if you are again amenities become even more important um, you know what we're seeing is just a, a, I would say both in the city and the suburbs this movement small and large to kind of mixed use if you will where people are, you know, you're, you're seeing office uh, campuses either torn down or half torn down, residential coming there, the other half, you know, remaining office or going to different uses. So there's a, you know, I, I think the, uh, um, the office footprint, even more dependent on what the surrounding area is like. Um, and then the building has to step up uh, to try to make up for what is not walkable or drivable to that building. Mm -hmm. So you just you sounds like you're staying busy now with the uh, a lot of different uh, projects throughout the country. We we are um, we're uh, and 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 a, and a you know just a a host of you know everything from uh, a lot of work in the industrial manufacturing side where you know you're seeing the impact of uh, of reshoring and people coming back and uh and manufacturing coming back uh and then you know logistics had sort of leveled off for a while because of interest rates but we're starting to see that uh click back up um you know there's there's been a pretty steady uh multifamily uh trend that has continued so you know for us uh, in a in a business that covers everything from retail to hospitality to to uh, mixed use and um, asset strategy and workplace. Um, it's been good, uh, I would say, you know, pretty steady on all fronts. Um, I think the, the, the only pause has been, you know, the interest rates have sort of slowed some of the decision-making down. 
and for some uh it's harder to make some of the projects pencil um yeah. but you know for the either developers or owners uh, that have a strong balance sheet this is a good time uh to to be doing projects mm -hmm. well well Ozzy, what else can you tell us about yourself? Uh, are you from the Twin Cities? Did you go to school here? Um, so I, uh, I actually grew up in Philadelphia. I was, mm -hmm. uh, I was a hockey player and uh, came out here uh, mm -hmm. went to the University of St. Thomas. Met my wife here, and uh, while we, uh, while we moved away for about a ten-year period, when I entered uh, what was my family's firm, uh, we moved back about twenty-one years ago. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, people always kind of are a little taken back that I could live anywhere and I live here in the frozen tundra. But uh, I think it's a uh, I think it's a really unique place. I think we have a very special um, blend. You know, I, I would say I, our city is just big enough. You know, we have mm -hmm. the sports, and the arts and, and, and we tend to not have a lot of the really big city problems. So uh, it's been a really great place to raise a family. So, uh, yeah, I have a. Uh, Three kids and uh, just recently became a grandfather. So, oh, nice! Congrats! Thank you, thank you. And it's it, I just talked to a hockey player recently in my previous podcast interview that I did, and, and it seems like there are a lot of hockey players for some reason who gravitate to real estate, construction, design. Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot you, of banging in the boards. <laughs> yeah. Did you play in college or? How, I'm well, sorry, say that again. Did you play college hockey or where? Played a little bit at St. Thomas, and uh, uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of good friendships from uh, from those hockey days. Okay, yeah, uh, but I'm uh, uh, yeah, uh, resident here, and um, you know that's been another nice thing about the pandemic is uh, you know, leading to the pandemic with as many offices as we as we have, um, you know, I was on the on the road, you know, toward the end four days a week. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's really nice to live in a world that's a combination of travel with Zoom. Absolutely. Um, so um, I guess what uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, I guess I'm curious how I like to always ask people how they got into this line of work and the profession that they're in and, and what uh, I guess what drove your interest in um, in, in this type of work. Yeah, you know, it's uh, so I uh, it, this was a family business with my dad's uh, fourteen mm -hmm. design firm when I when I entered it. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I it, I think my interest in the industry has changed over the years. Um, you know, when I first came in, um, uh, you know, having gotten a newly minted business degree, you know, it was more the business side that I was interested in and in trying to build mm -hmm. scale. Uh, I do think that. Um, it's an industry that uh, is clearly consolidating in, um, you know, I think being a, uh, an acquirer has, has served us well. And so, you know, I, I have enjoyed the business side of it. Um, and that was probably, you know, the driver in the beginning, but uh, uh, really do enjoy the diversity of the projects that, you know, that we do today. We, uh, uh, among some of the more notable, you know, projects around the country, we, we do um, a fair amount with, um, sports and branding and mixed use around sports arenas. So we did the uh, battery around the Brave Stadium. Uh, we're working on a similar development now for the Utah Jazz. Uh, and there's uh, a number of pro teams around the country who are really looking at this concept of, you know, putting structured parking in where they have parking lots and then converting uh, that into something that's not only income generating, but community building. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, is done you can only sell, you can only sell so many jerseys but this is uh you know an opportunity to really create a living brand mm -hmm. and so you know working with those those kind of clients um to take some of these storied brands and figure out how to translate it that into uh built environments so uh, pretty cool um on the retail side we uh touch uh just a, a wide range of brands we've done everything from the um, the flagship store for um, uh, the uh, American Girl, uh, you know, that always lights up. People are like, "Oh, American Girl!" I was like, "My, <laughs> my daughter there." And um, you've done, um, they've done a lot of brand work. Done brand work for Container Store, for Levi's. Uh, so it's, um, 
uh, it's been very um, fulfilling to start with something that was, you know, really small and uh, almost everywhere you go, you know, whether you're, uh, you know, in, in an airport, we do, um, we just did almost all of the uh, restaurant concession areas in LaGuardia. And I was just there yesterday. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's, uh, it's been really fulfilling to work with so many talented people um, and, and create opportunities to touch so much of uh, what we see every day. Yeah. Have you done any work at O'Hare or? We have not. We have not yet. Uh, but uh, our relationship is with uh, one of the concessionaires that does all that. So they're based on the success that we've had. They're starting to take us to more and more more airports. So uh, hopefully, it's just a matter of time until we're we're at O'Hare. <laughs> well, I have to ask because I worked there back in the day as uh, when I worked for American Airlines, and I always remember they had the best Chicago style hot dogs there at O'Hare. <laughs> so, you know. Yes, they do. <laughs> Makes me want to go back just for that. But um, <laughs> oh. anyway, well, well, Ozzy, it's been great talking to you. Any other parting thoughts before I let you go? No, I've really, I've really enjoyed our time together, and uh, really enjoyed what you do. Um, you know, uh, I, I think this is sort of a um, uh, an industry that, that you know people have ideas about, but I think until you know somebody does what you do to to really bring some of the facts and some of the stories to life. Um, I, I think it just brings it to another level. So thank you very much, Brian. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I enjoyed our conversation as well. And uh, hopefully we can stay in touch. That sounds great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.